A Ghost's Wedding I never imagined I would marry someone who was going to die. But we are all dying, right? We are all just slowly moving towards death from the day we are born. This vague, pseudo-spiritual nonsense is what people love to say when confronted with a terminal illness in someone else. The kind of statement used to dilute the enormity of the moment as if we are all in this whole being dead soon thing together. There is the most profound difference between acknowledging the very abstract notion that you and everyone you love will die and being able to Google the scientific statistics available rating your chances of being alive on your next birthday. You don't get to be in the same gang unless Dr Google, the seemingly perennial bearer of bad news, tells you those chances will be less than 5%. Greg constantly joked about our panic wedding, which I laughed nervously at. But he was correct. I was no serene fiancé or even a bridezilla. I was fucking panicked. I was panicked because the person I loved was going to die, probably very soon, and to plan a wedding held an air of farce around it. It reminded me of the engagement between two college friends when we were 17. Tom bought Sarah an opal engagement ring, a fact that astounded us all in the back row of our English A-level class. Their families threw an engagement party at a local community centre where we all arrived with our teenage confusion and gifts. What the fuck do you buy 17-year-olds who are getting married but are blatantly not going to get married? I had asked Beth as we trawled the BHS homeware section for ideas. We settled on a teddy-shaped cookie jar that spoke when you lifted the lid, because we were children being asked to play adult, and this is what we believed we would want in our adult married homes. We had watched as they opened the presents in front of everyone, genuinely bewildered at how happy they seemed to receive a double duvet, not to mention how any of the real adults in the room believed this wedding was actually going to happen. They wanted to get married because their teenage brains and society told them it meant they loved each other. But only three months after the bizarre party, the same underdeveloped cognition also told them the marriage couldn't go ahead, possibly for a reason as important as Tom couldn't get past the fact Sarah thought the latest Blur album was better than their earlier work. The duvet was ruined on purpose in anger with red wine and the opal ring was thrown into some tall grass. I asked Beth if she thought it would be rude to ask for the cookie jar back. She thought it best to let it go as collateral damage in teenage heartbreak. Greg and I got married for two reasons and I desperately wish one of them was to be given a talking teddy cookie jar. One was an enormous, overwhelming, romantic reason, and the other was secretive and strategic. The big intention to be married was to tie a big bow on the memory box of our relationship. I had seen people getting married in hospital beds, with nurses as witnesses, and the ill patient looking as though they may not make it through their vows, and always thought, what's the point? Because isn't marriage about the future? I get it now. It may not be a statement of long-term intention, but acknowledgement of the love that exists in real time. It is a marked moment that sticks a pin in the calendar with the note, this was us and we existed. We also desperately needed something nice to look forward to, given our days were mostly filled with choking down existential fear. The girls started referring to the ceremony as our wedding more of a day that encapsulated our entire family. It felt like our own personal Christmas day. The smaller, less romantic reason to get married was because anyone in a relationship without a ring will be royally fucked, legally and financially, if one of them dies, especially if you don't have a will. Sharing children and decades of cohabitation mean nothing to a society built on the pedestal of holy matrimony. Greg believed that to even talk about wills was an omen of bad luck and signified a total absence of hope, that drawing up the paperwork would somehow act as a seance for death to appear. 
For years, I had both people I knew and didn't know at all ask me in whispered tones if we had our affairs in order. The answer, like that of so many people our age, was no, not at all, because this was never going to happen to us. Until it did. The panic element of our wedding grew spores in every crevice, even the moments supposed to bring great joy. To claim, my wedding dress nearly killed me, feels like a cheap tagline from the Sunday sport where women detail stories of sex with aliens. Those are all obviously nonsense, while this is unfortunately true. I rushed around the department store alone, trying to find anywhere that sold milk. It turns out you can buy Korean bubble tea with mango-flavoured popping pearls in the centre of a city, but there is literally nowhere to buy a pint of semi-skimmed. Weaving through racks of clothes in the women's wear department, trying to find the food section, I saw a white dress hung high on a rail. It looked nothing special in the distance, but I was intrigued by the limp fabric that resembled a sad ghost who'd given up haunting. In fact, the fabric was beautiful crepe, the kind your mum would rub with her fingers to reassure you that will hang nicely. My mum wasn't with me, neither were my daughters or a gaggle of girlfriends with glasses of champagne in their hands, accustomed to when a bride goes to try her wedding dress on. I had only myself, a brightly lit, busy store filled with harassed parents and a half-drunk bottle of warm water in my bag. There was a tiny flicker of joy when I saw my reflection wearing the dress. I filmed a twirl in the mirror to show the girls and send to my mum, then quickly put my jeans and t-shirt back on, straight back into the search for milk. Everyone loved the dress, my mum suggesting we went back the next day to buy it. I wanted this so badly, to share something frivolously fun between the women in my family, but also... The thought made my windpipe contract. The temporary joy of it all would break me, but the girls were desperate to see the dress. So, it was decided. The dress was still there waiting for me, the wilting sad ghost which became animated when on. Walking from behind the curtain received the oohs and ahs of firework night, the kind of special reactions reserved only for brides. The sales assistant understood the language of wedding and followed the coups like breadcrumbs, spinning me round in front of the mirrors. I felt like a ballerina twirling in a children's jewellery box, with the twinkling reverie slowly winding down, while the dancer must keep spinning, her dizzy head only catching a glimpse of herself in the mirror and unable to stop. I desperately wanted to stop, but now shoe suggestions were appearing. Yes, I'll take them. No, I don't need to try them on. And specialist bras to sit invisibly under the dress are brought in. The more I added to the ensemble, the deeper I encapsulated the sad ghost, getting ready to marry her sweetheart, soon to join the dead. There was no fanfare or toast when buying the dress and all its accompaniments only a rush home to pack for a holiday beginning the next day. The dress hung in the wardrobe and was not given a second thought, my concerns refocused on the location of clean underwear and the girls' swimming costumes. It is then that my windpipe begins to close again. A good dose of an inhaler normally blows my asthma away, but it didn't work. The girls were downstairs, Greg at his parents, so I phoned mine. I don't want to worry you, but I can't breathe, I whispered down the phone at my dad. None of us were panicked because, as we learned when I was a kid, rule 101 of asthma was don't panic. My dad told me to phone for an ambulance as calmly as if he were telling me to call out a plumber to fix a leaking tap. It upped the ante when he changed his mind on listening to my wheezing breath and he got in his car to drive me himself. The day starts just like Christmas morning. My whole family awake early in my childhood home with opposing music blaring from different rooms. The buzz of excitement is mixed with a drop of unspoken sadness that no one acknowledges with words. 
but our eye contact lingers longer than usual, our smiles slightly more restrained. After weeks of trying to convince Bay to wear the glittery lilac dress I'd bought for her, she is still adamant she's wearing the Batgirl costume she wore for Halloween the year before. I'm quietly pleased. The costume dilutes the weight of the other wedding outfits and will draw attention away from me, although I myself feel like I'm wearing my own costume, coming to a fancy dress party as a bride. I like the idea of having a superhero at the wedding. In my childhood bedroom, I'm floating above my body, seeing all the past ages of myself busying around in this space, getting dressed for school, studying for exams, dressing up to go out for the night, crying at heartbreak, pacing the floor trying to get a baby to go to sleep. And now I am the bride, looking at the reflection of myself in a white dress and feather cape in a mirror still adorned with stickers from the 90s. I am an apparition, a ghost of myself living in a memory. Can you be nostalgic for the present moment? The whole event was stripped down in its organisation, a tiny wedding fit for a mouse, so small and purposefully quiet. All decisions are chiselled down to the bone. No guests except immediate family. No speeches, no toasts, no poignant dance. Each would act as tiny shards thrown over us like glass confetti and make every step of the day more painful. What would you say in a toast for a ghost's wedding anyway? What would you buy as a gift? There will be no gifts and no guests at this wedding because the doomed couple don't need a new set of crockery or pitying looks. We can't even add the saccharine statement, just your presence at our special day is enough because there are no invites either. There is one outlier in attendance, Beth. So horrified to not be part of the day, she volunteers, shoehorns herself in as videographer and her dad, Jeff, and his Jaguar as chauffeur. On the morning of the wedding, I'm so pleased I had given in to her very persuasive nature because she is the tonic we all need. The drive to the venue is silly and irreverent, bursting the black bubbles inside me. We become like teenagers again, giggling in the back seats and taking stupid photos of ourselves, while Jeff, a tour guide of the city's old walls, gives an impromptu lecture on all the deaths that occurred in that area and methods for covering up the smell of dead bodies. In case you're wondering, oranges and lemons make the best air freshener to cover decomposing flesh. Seeing Greg makes my heart lurch. He looks so handsome and healthy, no one would guess the amount of tumours eating his insides, and for a second, I forget myself. We walk down the aisle all together as a family, laughing and joking, soundtracked by Waiting for a Star to Fall by Boy Meets Girl, the sound that soundtracked so many of our night drives together. My memories stop here at the altar, except flashes of thoughts and feelings. What does a ghost think about when getting married? When did Bay get changed out of her Batgirl costume? Every single member of our families is wearing blue. What face shall I make when we get to the vows about in sickness and in health and till death do us part? Will everyone feel awkward? How will I say those words looking at Greg and not make them too poignant? I wonder if I'll ever get married again. What will that hypothetical future groom wear? I quite like pink shirts on men. Maybe I'll ask him to wear one. Or if it's way in the future, will we all be wearing silver? Maybe we will just be holograms. What do other brides think about during their wedding? How many think they are making a mistake? Do they hate particular people in the congregation? Are they going over all the most inappropriate things they could say in that moment? We spend the rest of the day at our favourite hotel, The Pig, a shady place set in the heart of the New Forest, where Greg and I have come for years to celebrate, relax and ignore the sand falling through the hourglass. Everyone heads to the bar while we retreat to our room, not for marital sex, but to sleep. Greg's body is fatigued by its unusual amount of physical assertion, 
Mine is broken by the emotional toll of the whole event. I'm not sure how many other brides can say they had a power nap in the middle of their wedding day. In the evening, we join everyone in the private dining room to eat a meal I cannot remember anything about. What did I order from the menu and what did any of us talk about? My only memory is shouting above the music across the large table to ask Bay if she was enjoying her meal, which she gave a thumbs up to, and the sinking feeling this will probably be the last time I am ever here. Greg is the first to retreat to bed while the adults sit round the drawing room fire to discuss wine-soaked topics. From the window, I watch Darley, Bay and their cousin play outside in the walled garden with jasmine and lavender, their powdery scent hitting you as you step outside. Their delight in the dark is the quintessential naivety of a childhood summer that I drink in to soften my hardening heart. Towards midnight, I carry Bay's soft, warm body to her makeshift nest on the floor of my parents' room and watch as sleep consumes her before her head hits the pillow. This is the kind of rest I crave, the absolute physical surrender of a child's late-night exhaustion and the feeling of unquestionable safety, that when you have had enough, you know you'll be carried to your bed to sleep in a carefree dream. Instead, I walk back barefoot to my own room, where Greg is in a different type of sleep, a fractious, almost unconscious stupor. I wonder if the only time he will ever experience the soft ease of a childlike sleep again will be when he dies. On the night of our wedding, my only hope for the future is that this is what death will feel like. <laughs>